First Peter chapter one. Are you there? We're going to start in verse 13. <clears throat> this is the word of God. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with the fear throughout the time of your exile knowing that you were ransomed from futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, that like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown to be the foundation of the world, and he was, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the, in, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Amen. We continue on Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, the series Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage. We'd love to have you, even if you're not married. It's good for you to know because you probably know somebody who's married. So it's helpful for you to have that information so that you can give people good counsel who will ask of you. That's Wednesday at 7 Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this, well, all of your word, it's powerful, effective. It has this capacity to, to affect us if we give permission to it. And so we pause right now and we simply say, speak. Give us ears to hear you. Father, I am so dependent on the Holy Spirit to really take the futileness of preaching and, and translate what I say somewhere between my mouth and listeners' ears that they would hear you. I don't know what people are faced with and dealing with. I can guess, and yet I'm very dependent that you will speak exactly what they need to hear. I trust that. I'm confident of that. Lord, today your word has a great deal of power. It has uh, a lot of confusion over the years because of the importance of it. So I pray that you would protect those listening, not to zone in on simply one word or phrase, but they would hear the entirety and that the Spirit of God would allow them to understand your intent. In Jesus' name, amen. The text ends with, and the word is good news that was preached to you. Good news, good news. Be holy, for I am holy, is what he says. And I'm drawn to that text because it is so misunderstood. So misunderstood. It's uh, two people can stand side by side. They look the same. They sound the same. They go to the same studies. They sit through the same services. One actually finds such joy and fulfillment and walking in the holiness that is given to us. The other one following a set of rules looks the part and yet struggles to maintain and finds being Christian a very big burden rather than a joy and an outflow. So it's really this. It's the difference between a religion and a relationship. More than often uh, when I have encountered people, uh, what comes to my mind right now is when I'm sitting uh, and getting a haircut and, uh, and 
They want to engage in conversation sooner or later, which I usually try to delay it. Sooner or later, they say, what do you do? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like, well, you know, I, I try to word it in one way or another. But they find out that I'm a pastor, and then they quickly rehearse in their head all the words that they maybe shouldn't have said or did say, and then they're apologetic, and I'm like, hey, hey, hey. And, and they often will say something like, well, I'm not very religious. And I'll say, well, that's good because I'm not either. And it kind of confuses them because, aren't you a pastor? Yes, I am, but I can't stand religion. And the, it, 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 it creates such a wonderful conversation as they get a little baffled with, yeah, but aren't you a preacher? Isn't that your job? And I say, yes, but religion isn't the same thing as what I do. And so we come to this text, and it sounds so religious. Be holy, for I am holy. It's like, wow, that's, that's big stuff. I don't, I don't, how, do you, how do you do that? So let me kind of uh, propose to you that holiness is about a living relationship with Christ and understanding that as we walk with him and as he live with him, the holiness is actually not something we do. It's what he does and who he is. And because of who he is and what he does, it's something that happens to us as we walk with him. We don't strive, is what I'm saying. So the word be, let's just consider the break these two things. Be holy. All right? Be. Be is something that uh, it, it's literally to come into being is what the word behind it says in the Greek. To come into being. You can either just naturally do that or you learn to do that, but it is a choice. We have the Beatitudes where Jesus went through the Beatitudes. Be merciful. There's a whole list. I think of... Uh, it, I grew up in Nebraska, so it's very natural for me to be a Nebraskan. I get it. It's my culture. I married a Texan, and we moved to Houston, and I had to learn how to be a Texan. Uh, when they come to the table and, and they want to know what kind of Coke you want, you're like, well, uh, Coke. And I'm like, no, what, what kind of Coke? Well, what kind of Coke do you have? Well, we have Pepsi. And it's like, it's a cultural thing, but while in Minnesota, if you go to order, they're like, well, what kind of soda would you like? I'm like, pop, pop, and oh, that's like soda. It's the Midwest. It's culturally speaking. We moved to Wisconsin, and you had to be a Green Bay Packer fan. And it's so this being, as you come into the church of Jesus Christ, it is this declaration of being holy. Now, while in Texas, I was able to, this is, shows my age, I was able to be a Houston Oilers fan. Now you're thinking, ah, uh, the math. It was the 80s. <laughs> when I went to Wisconsin, I had to be a Packer fan. But the difference between being an Oilers fan and being a Packer fan is that I, I became a Packer fan. So that when I left Wisconsin, it still exists. It's still a part of the residual of being. And this is what it is about being in Christ, is that his holiness, being in Christ, it's not um, just wearing the t-shirt. It's, it's something that internally happens to you. you. You have such this connection with the person of Jesus that his holiness and what he has done is part of who we are and what we become. Be holy, for I am holy. You have your Bible. Just go to, to uh, 1 Thessalonians for a moment. So go to the left if you're in the New Testament, which you should be if you're in 1 Peter. And 1 Thessalonians, you'll see Timothy, Titus, Timothy. When you get to 2 Thessalonians, you're almost there. But 1 Thessalonians, and I'm going to go to the fifth verse, a fifth chapter. <clears throat> the 19th verse says, don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophecies, test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now look at verse 23, the fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians. This is kind of the, the benediction that he is speaking over the Thessalonian people. And he says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. Now, here's some fascinating language here. This essence of being holy is another word we call sanctified or sanctification. What does that word mean? 
that word sanctify or to be sanct sanctification it means that it is set apart for something very special in other words you only use it so we are sanctified or set apart for the kingdom of god for the purpose of relationship with jesus let me illustrate that beside our bathroom toilet in our house is a brush it's not a hairbrush it's a toilet brush now it is sanctified or set apart to be used for the toilet should i use it for my hair or cleaning the sink no you have been sanctified or set apart by jesus and he said you are for my kingdom i intend to use you in relationship with me and not for the sink or your hair make sense that's what sanctification means, to be set apart for something for a very specific design and purpose. He has called you out. In fact, in Thessalonians chapter 4, just turn the page one page back. Well, maybe you don't have to turn your page, but look at verse 3 of the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians. This is the will of God. You ever wondered that? What's the will of God for my life? Huh? Anybody here? Okay, I guess I'm the only one who's ever wondered what the will of God is, but someday you might reach that point. We were like, I wonder what God's will is for my life. This is it. Look at the verse. This is the will of God for you, that your sanctification. Say what? Yeah, it's God's will that you be set apart and then there's a whole list of things that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to control his own body and holiness and honor, not in passionate lust like the Gentiles. Look at verse 8. Whoever disregards these things dis disregards not man, but God who, what? Gives his Holy Spirit to you. Sanctification, to be set apart, is for the very purpose of allowing the Spirit of God to work in us, to us, through us. Why? That's the good news. We go back to 1 Peter chapter 1. That's the gospel of the good news. It's good news. It is not up to you. You can't do it. Go to Colossians chapter 2. So if you're, you're in Thessalonians, keep turning to the left. Colossians chapter 2. Now I'll, I'll start in verse 20. This is kind of hard because it, I'm, I'm jumping into the middle of a whole teaching about putting on and putting off the whole self but it's the focus on uh, sanctification. Be holy, for I am holy. And what I'm trying to build the case is this. It's a relationship, not rules. Okay? That's where I'm going with this. I, I don't want you to try and guess. I'm trying to be really clear with it. Verse 20, second chapter, Colossians. If, and that means it's a condition, if with Christ you died, meaning that if, if Christ is only a theory, if he's only a thought, if you haven't really accepted Christ as the Son of God, then this, this isn't really true for you. But if he really is the Son of God and he is the only way, truth, and life to you, then you have died with Christ to the elementary spirits of the world. Verse 20. Why then, as if you still live in the world, do you submit to regulations, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings these have indeed an appearance of wisdom these have an appearance of wisdom these have an appearance of wisdom did you get that part okay i'm going to move on then in promoting self-made religion and asceticism severity to the body here's the line i want you to grasp but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh what's he saying there is a sin nature in each of us that sin nature loves to do serve self it is drawn to self it's different for everybody Somebody might have, they really are hung up on gossip. Somebody else is hung up on lust. Somebody else is hung up on pride. Somebody else is hung up on unforgiveness. Everybody kind of has their, their thing. But rules don't change it. 
Rules don't change that desire. And what he's saying is, be holy, for I am holy. Because when you enter into the relationship of Jesus, because of who Jesus is and his holiness and his righteousness, these things are a byproduct, is that they're set away. It's not a set of rules. Now, I grew up uh, in a Christian home, and yet because I grew up in that environment, my own misinterpretation of what happens became very rule-oriented. Part of what that was just because that's my parents and how they, they weren't intentionally trying to teach me rules, but Christians don't talk like that. Christians don't act like that. I remember something very specific. I was 16 years old, and um, a certain word became popular to be used, and, and I uh, might have been like crud or something like that. And I was standing in the kitchen and I used that word and my mom marched across the kitchen and cranked up to take a swing and I grabbed her hand and she's like, you let me slap you. And I'm like, uh, you can just say, don't say that word. <laughs> you let go. I'm like, uh, we got to work this out. I'm 16. <laughs> I think she realized at that point that she couldn't slap me anymore in that capacity. That makes it really sound like Really bad, doesn't it? <laughs> you see, the, the response sometimes of parents, and I speak as a parent, is we don't want our kids to act a certain way because it embarrasses us and we don't teach them to have an ownership and a faith with Jesus. We teach them how to behave so that we're not embarrassed so that when they're 18 and they get to make their own choices, they are no longer around to not embarrass you and you can't figure out why they just ran their life amok because you didn't, you didn't teach them. You taught them rules so that you're not embarrassed and look good. Be holy for I am holy is about a relationship with Jesus. It's about learning how to walk with him and talk with him. It is not perfection. It is not sinless perfection. Please grasp this. So many people get stuck thinking that sanctification and holiness means that you are absolutely perfect and you won't sin. Man, I wish that was the case. But I am here to testify that's not true. What is true is the person of Jesus and his consistency to be holy. That he is holy, he is perfect, and the, what happens here is this process is that I either choose to die and live with him daily. Another kind of language it says in the New Testament is that we pick up the cross daily. We daily pick up the cross and follow him. Means this, every day God says you have a choice to surrender to his power, his way, his will, or to do your own will. You were created in his image and that's why you have that. It's not a forced deal. He invites you. He invites you into this every day. Why? Because it's about love. He loves you. He paid the price. He invites you into this relationship. And now, this is why it says, if you love him, you will obey his commandments. Okay, that sounds like a bunch of rules. You see, obeying his commandments is a natural outcome of love. It's not the rules, it's the response that happens because I love him and because the Holy Spirit now resides in me. And because the Holy Spirit resides in me, I do things that I normally wouldn't do if it was just up to me. Does that make sense? So Galatians chapter five, you need to see this. Keep going to the left. We're kind of like working our way back to the front of the Bible, aren't we? Galatians chapter five, verse 16 but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. This is the very thing I'm talking about. Be holy, for I am holy. Well, that sounds like a bunch of rules. It's not. It's about walking with the person of Christ. But the conflict that we have, that we live out every day, is that the Spirit of God that lives within us because we are choosing to be holy, it is just that. It's a choice. And the Spirit sets itself against the flesh. And there's this war, there's this conflict that happens internally. 
if you don't let the Spirit of God put to death the flesh. Did you hear the if? That's conditional. If you give permission for the flesh to have life, that war doesn't go away. If you give permission for the flesh to rule and reign, the Spirit of the Lord and the conviction of the Spirit begins to fade and it gets quieter and quieter. Just the opposite is true. If you give yourself to the Spirit of God and you allow the Spirit of God to change your desires, we've talked repeatedly about Romans 8, 13, if by the power of the Holy Spirit you put to death the desires of the body, then you'll live. In other words, I can't change my desires. Rules don't change the desires. The, <coughs> excuse me, I'll catch up. Swallow. The rules don't change the desires of sin. Only the Spirit of God. And so my my purpose in life every day, every morning, is to allow the Holy Spirit to put to death those desires. This is why we come back here to Galatians chapter 5, if I walk by the Spirit. That's a daily thing. If is conditional. If I choose not to walk by the Spirit of God, the desire and the passion of the flesh boils up. It exists. What does it do? Well, look at verse 19. The works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of rage, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the things like these. I warned you that those who do such things, they won't inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, how do you know whether you are being controlled by the flesh or by the Spirit of God? Because of these things, the Spirit is love and joy peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. There it is again. There's no law. Why? Because it's the person of the Spirit of God. He doesn't need a law. Now look at verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. This is so important for you to understand. You have a responsibility every day to keep in step with the Spirit of God. If you do, being holy is a non-issue. It happens. If you choose not to keep in step with the Spirit, holiness is a burden. It's difficult. In fact, your flesh can't do it. And you come to the end of yourself, you go like, there's no way I can do this. I'm just going to go do my own thing because it's impossible. Surely God is loving and forgiving, so he'll just forgive me when I get there. No, you see, that isn't how it works. He has given us the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why he said you are overcomers of this world. That's why he says you are more than conquerors. Because he's already taken care of it, he just invites us to walk in it. And if we choose not to walk in it, we end up Not inheriting the kingdom of God is what the text says. That's harsh language. God does, it tells us in Peter that he wishes that no one would perish. He wants everyone to have eternal life. That's why he's paid the price. But he invites us into that. It's a response. It's a free gift. That's why it becomes good news. It's just that works deceive it works trick us works make us look holy works keep us from really understanding and walking the spirit empowered life because we think it's how we look and we have that temptation to look good we have that temptation to not really embrace the fullness and the joy of the Holy Spirit, but to just do because people see and we crash and burn because it's not genuine. Coming back to 1 Peter, he uses the language about the relationship by going into chapter 2 about describing Jesus and that relationship as the cornerstone. Very briefly, let me tell you about the cornerstone. This is so significant. Jesus is our cornerstone. What does it even mean? If you're you're not into construction, let me try to describe this quickly. 
a cornerstone, especially back in, in the New Testament times and Old Testament times, because they didn't have the kind of digital electronic tools that we have, they would have a cornerstone. That cornerstone was absolutely square and perfect, and it would be set in a very specific place, square, level, just absolute. If it was off just a little bit, it threw the whole building off. So the cornerstone establishes the entire building. For an example, this building is 120 feet, okay? If the cornerstone is set, and it's just a sixteenth of an inch off at that end, that means 160 feet out, it's a foot off. Why? Because that's how significant the cornerstone, everything is measured off the cornerstone. We don't build that way anymore, but that's why it says the cornerstone the builders rejected. The builders, people of the church, is that he's referring to, looked at Jesus and they go like, mm, we need a perfect stone and Jesus isn't it, the law is. And so the builders reject Jesus. That's the language he's using here. That's why it says Jesus is a stumbling block to those who don't get it. But he's perfect and he is life to those. He becomes the cornerstone to us. Why? Because everything is measured back to the life of Jesus. We measure back to him and his perfection. It is off of his righteousness, not mine. His goodness. Wow, what a relief that is. That's good news, y'all. Why would this matter? Why should you pay attention to the command of be holy for I am holy? Because it measures this. It measures whether you are doing religion or relationship. That's why it matters. If you're doing religion... Jesus doesn't matter, and your relationship doesn't matter to him. I just want to forewarn you, you're going to come up short. Because it warns us in, in Revelation. We could go to Revelation, we could read it. I'm not going to take the time because i got two minutes to wrap this whole thing up. But if we go to Revelation and, and we look at chapter 20, there's the great right throne judgment, and we stand there, and the books of what we've done are opened up, and we're judged according to the things that we've done. But there's another book called the Lamb's Book of Life, and if your name is not in the Lamb's Book of Life, it doesn't matter what you have done, you're sent to the place of judgment, of lake and fire. So it matters what you do. There are books that have recorded what you do, but what matters more is, is your name in the Lamb's Book of Life? That's the cornerstone. That's Jesus. That's why you need to be holy. It's that relationship that allows us to walk in him. It doesn't mean you're perfect. You're going to fail. But he is perfect. Isn't that beautiful? One last thing. I promise I'll, I'll end with this, I think. Pride and the temptation to fall on the rules and how you look will keep you from that relationship. Ah, oh, Jesus, not again. How many times have I asked you to forgive me of this? I promise this time I won't ask you to forgive me. I'll just take care of it myself because I'm so embarrassed. Here I am again. You see, that's pride that keeps you from the cornerstone. Be holy because he is holy, requires us to press into him daily, uh, give permission for the Holy Spirit to live. And I, I, could, I could spend several sermons on that whole piece right there because it's so significant. But the overall picture here is this. He's the cornerstone of your life if you surrender to him daily and you give permission for the Holy Spirit to live in you and through you so that life becomes full of victory and joy, not defeat and not a burden. I want you to close your eyes, bow your head. There's a lot of ifs in this because he invites us. You were made in his image. And because you were made in his image, you get the freedom to choose his gift or not. If you have never made the choice to make Jesus the Lord of your life, the cornerstone of your life, do that this morning. It would go something like this, Jesus, I have made a mess of myself, but I need you. I surrender to you, and I ask that you forgive me of all sin and unrighteousness. I need your righteousness. Wash me by your blood. Forgive me and cleanse me. Release me 
from the consequences and the penalty of sin. Maybe you've said that. It's the starting point. You did that. But the temptation of rule following has dragged you away from the grace of God. Return this morning to Him and choose to be one who lives daily by His grace. Simply say, Father, forgive me. I've tried to prove that I am lovable by working that you loved me while I was yet a sinner. I choose to surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit. And I ask that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you change in me the desire for sin. I don't want it. Remove it. If there's unforgiveness, give me a heart that wants to forgive. If there's lust, give me a heart not to lust. If there's pride, give me a humble spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit, whatever the issue is, set it before him and ask in Jesus' name by the power of the Holy Spirit to put it to death. Then you will live. So, Lord, I pray that the hunger for you and for your word would be stirred within each one of us not for our glory, not for our sake, although we benefit, but for your sake, because your word is true and faithful. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.